is in place. <clears throat> the following skits are loosely based on true events and the names have not been changed to protect the innocent. Larry, you got a minute? I gotta run an idea by you. Yeah, Avery, what's up? Well, I was thinking about, I was thinking about updating the dining room. How come you're so far away from me? I don't know. <laughs> about updating the, the dining room? Yes. Really, what's, what's on your mind? What do you wanna do? Well, I would like to get new carpeting and I wanna change the paint color from this to this. Okay, just reach the yep. across. Okay. the longest table I've ever seen. Um, so let's see, you want to change the paint color from what we currently have, which is heavy cream to cream in my coffee? Mm -hmm. Yep. Aren't those the exact same color? No, they're slightly different. Uh, emphasis on slightly. Cream in my coffee. Who ever heard of a paint called cream in my Very. coffee? Okay, well, how much is this going to cost? Well, I think I can keep it under a thousand bucks. A thousand bucks? Avery, I don't think we've got a thousand bucks earmarked in our budget to change what we currently have as a paint color to virtually the same color. <laughs> you know what? I, I think we're going to just have to save our pennies and maybe do this in, I don't know, 2015. 2015? Yeah, 2015. Okay. I guess that's what we'll do. Hey, Avery? Yeah. You know I love you. I know. I love you too. Oh. The very next day. Um, what you doing? Hey, Avery, you're never going to guess. I was in Best Buy today, and they were having a sale on the latest and greatest um, high-tech, high-resolution, uh, watch them call it thingamajig. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. 20% off. So with a deal like that, you know I had to just buy it. Okay, and uh, how much did this... Uh, new, latest and greatest, high-tech, high-resolution, whatchamacallit, thingamajig cost. That's, that's the best part. It was under a thousand bucks. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. A thousand bucks, huh? Yeah. It's going to look great in my office, don't you think? Uh, well, since it was under a thousand bucks, don't you think it would look better in, um, I don't know, say the dining room? The dining room? No, it would look ridiculous in the dining room. Maybe really, in the dining room? In the dining room. Ooh, yeah, the dining room. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha there. The dining room. Yep, dining room. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hey, Abes, what do you think uh, about going to Best Buy with me? Why? You got to get a new surround sound system for your new latest and greatest high tech, high resolution thingamajig, whatchamacallit? No, I gotta get my money back so I can go get some cream in my coffee. Aw, uh, thanks, Lily. <laughs> Grab your purse, let's go. <laughs> Lessons of, uh, over time about finance and appetites and your eyes and the things you look at, the things you want. Some of us learn slower than others. You know, when we were first married, we went out and bought like $350 pot and pan set. We bought encyclopedias. We bought all kinds of stuff from door-to-door -door salesmen because we were just, we didn't get it. You know, it took us a while and still today, you know, we've got to be so, so careful as to, you know, where we, what we do with what we have. 
Turn to uh, Psalm 24 with me this morning. And thanks so much, Jeff and Kathy. That was awesome. Those guys are amazing. And uh, I do barely remember the guy that they depicted in that skit. But uh, I still look something like him, only a little heavier. But uh, stand with me this morning, if you would, in honor of God's word. And we're going to read together Psalm 24, verses 1 through 6. Psalm 24, verses 1 through 6. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Selah. Again, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, and all who live in it. You know, the, th- the thought from that verse captures the core of our thinking about stewardship. Do this with me this morning, if you would. Take out your wallet or your purse if you want to hold that up. I want you to take it in your left hand. I'm not going to ask you to give. We already took the offering. (laughs) I'm going to ask you to hand it to your neighbor and let him give. No, (laughs) no, (laughs) no. I just want you to hold that in your hand for just a minute. And I want you to take your right hand and put it over your heart. And I want you to say this to the Lord. All that I am and all that I have and all that I hope to be is yours. Father, hear our hearts today. We just want to know you. We want to serve you. We want to love you. We want our lives to count for something. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open your word to our hearts today. Change us, we pray, and we give you all that we have in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you can put your wallet back in your pocket and sit down. God is the maker, and therefore, God is the owner. That's the basic premise. He owns it, we don't. We could say that just about everything in our lives. That's true with the clothes you have on your back, the car that brought you here, your house, everything that you have, even the ability to breathe and your heart to beat. It was all made by God, and he owns it all. Everything is his, and we are the bearers of incredibly great authority and responsibility over all the stuff that God made. In fact, in his absence, we are the bearers of his image in the world. If people are going to see God, you know where he's, they're going to have to find him? In you, in me. We are the image of God made in his image for the purpose of bringing his kingdom to the earth for all to see. In Luke 12, 48, he tells us, that from everyone who has been given much, and that's us, much will be required. For the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked than, than him who has been entrusted with little. Turn left to Matthew 16, or 6 with me, Matthew 6, verse 19, and we're going to be camping in this passage for a little while today. We'll be bouncing around to some others, but we're going to come back here to Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24. All of life comes to us as a sacred trust. The world we live in, the relationships we enjoy, our time, our talents, our resources, our treasures, all of it. And because we're stewards, there's a strict accountability relationship that we have with God with regard to all the things that we have. The upshot is this. There is a stupendous reward for faithfulness in the word. When you look at, when, when Paul, toward the end of his life, was looking for one thing from God, you know what it was? That he would hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what he was looking for. Faithfulness is a requirement of our faith. 
Jesus said in Luke 16, 10 through 13, from, in the paraphrase, he said it this way, Jesus went on to make these comments, if you're honest in small things, you'll be honest in big things. If you're a crook in small things, you'll be a crook in big things. If you're not honest in small jobs, who will put you in charge of the store? No worker can serve two bosses. He'll either hate the first and love the second or adore the first and despise the second. You can't serve both God and the bank. And here in Matthew 6, 19, the same story told through Matthew. And if Jesus could have his say today, this is what he would quote to us this morning. Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth, or God and mammon. There's no easy coexistence between God and money. There's a, a necessary stress there. They coexist, no doubt. I mean, you walked into this room today, and you probably had money in your wallet and a Bible in the other hand. They, the two can coexist. There is money and there is the word and spirituality. But if they're going to coexist rightly, there's going to have to be some strict parameters on the relationship. You know, God is going to have to be firmly enthroned, firmly enthroned in the very center of your household. And money is going to have to live out back, tethered to a short leash. <laughs> Understand how this works in our lives. Money wants to control us. This materialistic society that we live in today, it wants to dominate. And we've got to make sure that we put everything in its right perspective. And it has to start by putting God on his rightful throne. He has to be there in the right place at the center. We've got to be right on God and right on money or we're not going to be right in eternity. He makes it real clear. This is absolutely, by the way, countercultural. <laughs> this is so different from the way we're taught. This is Jesus in his prophetic office getting in the face of American Christians because this is so different from everything that we see around us. Jesus is going to tell you how to get right on the money so you can enjoy eternal happiness with him forever. There are some things that we need from this passage in order to be right with God when it comes to money. Three paragraphs here and three primary thoughts that come with them. The first one is we've got to have the right storehouse. It deals with the right storehouse. If, if we're going to be right on the money, we've got to have the right storehouse. Is it going to be earth or is it going to be heaven? Where is it going to be? What storehouse are we talking about here? The way I've been pitting God against money so far might give you the indication that money is inherently evil, but it's not. There's nothing wrong with money at all. In fact, Jesus says, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Notice here, he says, it's not wrong to save money. It's not wrong to save it. It's not wrong to, he tells us, commands us to store up. Note that it's not all wrong to have some concern for your personal financial situation. In fact, the Bible tells us explicitly, if we don't provide for our own household, we're worse than an infidel. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to be honest in our business dealings. And we need to be frugal in our stewardship. He says, store up for yourselves treasures. He tells us to do that. So it isn't that the money itself is wrong. The crux of the matter is not the money. It's the storehouse where the money goes. That's the problem. Store it up in heaven, Jesus says. In heaven, not on earth. Not on earth and in heaven, just in heaven. Period. That's what Jesus says to do. And there are three primary reasons why. First is safety. He says treasure on earth is susceptible to corruption. It could be destroyed. 
decay, can get stolen. If you store it up down here, it's going to fly out of your hands. One way or the other, it's here and it's gone. That's what money does. But money stored in heaven is safe. It's secure. It's not going anywhere. There's no corruption in heaven. There's no thieves in heaven. And the second reason is yield. There's another reason we store up treasures in heaven. Here in this world, we like to invest our money. You know, we look at our retirement accounts and some of us have choices with what kind of funds we're going to put our money in, whether it's going to be in cash accounts or annuities or whether we're going to put it in something that bears interest with greater risk or doesn't bear much interest and has little risk. But we make decisions about where we're going to put our money. A good rate of return today for most accounts would 6 to 7% would be appreciated today for most of the investments that we have because, of course, the interest rates are very low at this time. But nonetheless, that would be a, a good one. In a huge economic boom time, 20%, 30%, wow, I mean, that would be an awesome return on investment. But the Bible says, it, when it speaks of a heavenly investment, it says that they yield 30 60 or 100 fold return. That's 3,000, 6,000, and 10,000 percent. Understand that the yield in heaven is much greater than the yield here on earth. What God can do in multiplying what you give to Him is phenomenal. Verse 21 says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hearts and treasures interact with each other. Initially, your treasure goes where your heart goes. That's how it works to start with. You know, let's say you have your heart set on a new car, uh, a new whatchamajig. You got your heart set on something, a bigger house, a computer upgrade, whatever it is. Your money's going to follow your heart, no doubt. But then there's a reciprocal reaction. At some point, that turns around. Your money goes that direction, and then your heart goes all the more in that direction. Once you've invested in that, now you want the next best thing in that. Jesus says where your treasure is, ultimately that's where your heart is going to go. So we're going to have to lead our hearts toward heaven by investing our resources there. And he's emphatic about it. In verse 19, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. And, and probably the best translation to that would be something like this. Stop! Just stop storing up things for yourselves on earth. Cease and desist right now. It's time to make a break. It's time to say enough is enough. And then in itself is wise counsel to say, let's begin a step toward good stewardship. Just stop where you are. I mean, some of us, Jesus might call to back up a little bit. You know, you're going to have to simplify your life here or there. You're going to have to downgrade. You're going to have to get into the center of my will and slow down on the spending stuff. But a great first step is just to stop where you are. If you're living in an 800-square-foot house, you should stop desiring that 2,500-square-foot house. If you've got a, a car today that's 10 years old, you've got to stop desiring that new car. You've got to just stop. Stop where you are. If you've got a 700 megahertz processor, you've got to not be desiring that 2.4 megahertz uh, processor. Understand what I'm saying. We've got to stop sometimes just where we are in order to start doing what God would have us do. Just stop. You don't need that. You don't need that other thing. Don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. We live in a consumer economy here as American Christians where the exchange of dollars is what drives our economy. That's what makes it happen. Business is about the task of creating within us need and desire to consume. That's what it's all about. You know, because if dollars stop exchanging hands, then our economy stops working. But Jesus says, stop. Stop sending your dollars through that consumer economy time and again. Start storing it up in heaven. Find yourself a different kind of investment vehicle here. The ministry of your local church, international ministry concerns, help for the poor, a missionary who's out there raising support. Start investing in that direction. Do what Jesus says and do it now. Jesus' words are not only countercultural, but they're also 20, 30, 40 years down the line. Because the conventional wisdom of the world is to tell us 
that we're going to need a stack of money storehoused here if we're going to enjoy a comfortable retirement. You know, the world is telling us we're going to be done working and we're still going to have 30 years left in our life. So you're going to need a stack of money in order for you to be comfortable in your retirement. That's the basic benchmark. Jesus says, stop. The conventional wisdom is that you're going to need a million dollars to retire. Stop. You don't need to be a millionaire. Where in the Bible does it say that you need to be a millionaire? It does say things like, look at the ant. You know, ants, in good reason, they store up in lean time, or uh, in, in good times, uh, stores so that they'll have something in the lean times. It's biblical to save. I'm not saying don't save. But a million dollars? I mean, we're going to, to rest in Jesus' care when we're 75 and 85. We're going to pray, give us this day our daily bread then, just as we pray now. Yes, modest, reasonable savings is fine. The Bible commands it. But we don't need to play golf and enjoy some 25-year utopia here. Understand that everything good is over there. It's on the other side of life. And too many people think that they're working towards something here when there's nothing going to be left here. We're all going to die. Newsflash. Every single person in this room is going to one day breathe their last on this earth. Whether because Jesus comes or whether you pass away, but it's coming for all of us. And so why do we insist on banking everything here? We need to start in, in, in more, giving more, in more radical ways toward heaven. You start in here and now supporting ministry. And when you turn 65 or 70, 70, you've got enough to cover all the basics, sure. But you should still be about giving and investing yourself until you die. You should die with a shovel in your hand building the kingdom. We don't stop somewhere along the line. Where do you find that in Scripture? It's not there where you just sit down and play golf. No, it's about causing and continuing to help the kingdom to grow around the world. Listen, there are people that are dying and going to hell today that just need somebody to go and tell them about Jesus Christ. And there are people willing to go, and yet they don't have the funds to go. We should be a part of help sending them. I mean, let's say all that money that you could have saved for yourself, you invested in ministry. Everything, you put it all into ministry. And let's say that you... You become a millionaire. You've done it. You've saved that million dollars, okay? And you've got that sitting there. Now, let's take the other side of that and say that we've invested that money into the ministry. And let's say that this little girl, 15 years old, named Grace, somebody came to her as a result of the giving of Christians on the other side of the world. Somebody came to her and led her to Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something. You won't be in heaven five minutes before you'll be on your knees with your hands high in the air praising God and saying it was worth it. I mean, how could I have dreamed that it wouldn't have been? And yet we do. How could I have ever thought about playing golf for 20 years when I could have gotten the gospel to one more person? And that grace is the recipient of somebody's sacrifice somewhere. What have I done? Where have I reached my grace out there? Have we done enough? As for me and my house, we're never going to save more money for the future than we give to ministry right now. We're not going to sacrifice present kingdom impact for a future on earth that has no guarantees at all. Why not put it into the kingdom? We've got to let the gospel speak radically to our culture, which tells us just the opposite of what Jesus says. Store up treasures in earth. Put it all away. What we need are bigger homes, bigger cars, faster cars, newer cars. We need bigger computers and more of them. We need this, we need that. No, we don't. What we need is to see people receiving the gospel of Christ. Everywhere we can go, any impact we can make, let's make it for him. Whether it's giving to the poor or investing yourself in an inner city ministry or, or getting involved in missions or sacrificially giving so that missionaries can be sent, whatever it takes, what am I doing for the sake of the kingdom? Jesus is not making an argument here for morality. He's not saying that if you want to be righteous, you have to give to ministry. That's not what he's saying. His argument is not for morality. His argument is for wisdom. 
I mean, if you're building up treasures on earth, it's not so much that you're wicked, it's that you're stupid. <laughs> That's what he's saying. We've got to have the right storehouse. Understand, there it will cause eternal benefits. Here, it will just rust and moth will just chew it up. It'll be gone before you know it. It's amazing. Have any of you had those kinds of bank accounts where you look in there and you go, wow, where did all that money go that I had? It just disappears. It's amazing, isn't it? You start the week with $100 in your pocket and by Thursday, we look in there, there's only 20 and you're thinking 80 bucks. Are you kidding me? Where did it go? It goes. This world will eat that stuff. It's amazing. Our culture will just eat it up. We have to make a conscious decision that we're going to put our money into kingdom resources because we believe that God has a plan for this world. And the only reason I've been given everything I've been given, whether it's a relationship or whether it's, it's uh, just the breath I breathe, whether it's the kind of job I have, whatever it is, the gifts, the talents, the experiences, whatever I have was all given to me for kingdom purposes. Not a single bit of it was given so that I could someday re re retire and fish and golf away my last 20 years on earth. It wasn't given for that reason. So we've got to have the right storehouse. Secondly, we must have the right stance. The right stance. We have to have the right stand, the right perspective, the right mental, emotional posture when it comes to our money. You know, that's what that second paragraph of that passage in Matthew 6 addresses. The eye, he says, is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I mean, do you see the picture here? What he's saying is, is that if your eyes are clear, if they're seeing right, then your whole body will be filled with light. It's like a window. But if the eye can't see, it's like you pull a shade over that window and the only thing in there is darkness. And that darkness is great. You can't even see what's right and wrong anymore because you've got the shades pulled over your eye. You've got to have the right posture, the right stance toward money. And it begins with perspective. It starts with vision. Our bodies go where our eyes are looking. You know, I'm a semi-clumsy person. Some might say a clumsy person. I prefer semi-clumsy. This will be in a skit next week. No. I, I have, down in my basement, I have a treadmill. And that treadmill right now is gathering way too much dust. What are you laughing at? But, <laughs> but it, it's gathering too much. But listen, that treadmill, I had next to my treadmill, I have a I had a television set that sat there next to the left of my treadmill. I have this television set. So I could flip on the news while I'm jogging on my treadmill, you know, and change the channel and get the latest CNN or Fox or whoever. I could switch the channel while I'm running on my treadmill. But what I found was the television set was over to the left on a table. And so as I'm running on my treadmill... I'd start to drift off to the left until I, until I hit that stationary side of the treadmill, not the rubber part, but the little aluminum part. When I'd hit that, you know what would happen? Whoa, whoa! And, I, and you look around, see if anybody's watching in my basement. But I mean, I, I would just t almost knock, sometimes it did actually knock me down, just about pull out my shoulder, grabbing for that little bar on the side, you know, as that thing would. What happens is that you get your eyes off of what you're doing. You start looking to the left and the right and all of a sudden you find that you're going that direction. You know, in 1 Timothy 6, 10, Paul is saying the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, with eyes for money in other words, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It's incredible how the love of money has nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven. And if we get our eyes over there, if we allow that to take us in that direction, we're going to stumble. All of a sudden, your life is about other things. The things of God are less important. The things of the world are more important because that's where my eyes are. The stance we take toward God and toward money is determined by our vision. Good eyes, in this context, means singular eyes. 
That's what he's talking about. Eyes that are focused on one object of desire, and that's Christ and his kingdom. Bad eyes, in this context, is informed by Jewish thought that says evil eye, the bad eye. It wanders from God, and it wanders from the things of God toward possessions. The evil eye is miserly, it's selfish, it's greedy. That's what the evil eye is. Jesus says, if you've got one of those kinds of eyes, you might think you're enlightened, but you're actually living in the darkness. The light within you is actually darkness. You think you're smart and wise and going down the right road, and you're filling your whole life with darkness, Jesus says. We've got to have good eyes. We've got to have the right stance here. We've got to have that steward stance that says we are soon to be evaluated for our care of the things that God has given us. Understand, we are going to be held accountable. If we've been blessed with all the happy things in our life, we are accountable for them. All of the good things in your life, you're going to have to give an account to God for how you use them and, and how you testified about them. Matthew Henry, a great Bible commentary, has said it this way, it ought to be the business of every day to prepare for our last day. Our business every day should be preparing us for our last day. We've got to know what's important and what's not. The average life cycle of a dollar in the United States, 18 months. A dollar lasts, on average, 18 months. It gets exchanged so many times that it gets worn out in 18 months. It's a poor store of wealth, too. The dollar is a poor place to put it. Even if you keep it crisp and new, we have this thing in our country called inflation. Have you ever heard of it? The dollar will be worth less tomorrow than it was worth today, even if it looks new. In a couple of years, it's just not going to buy what it can buy today. So the economists of the world tell us, you have to put it to work. You have to invest this thing so it yields some return. Because if you sit on it, it's going to lose value. You've got to, the financial planners of this world would say, you have to think long term with this dollar. You know, don't think about what it can buy today. No, think about what it could yield for you 20, 30, 50 years from now. Put it to work. Don't touch it. Don't keep dipping into what you've been saving long term and don't keep moving it around. Find a good general fund there and leave it there. Don't, don't try to time the market. Don't play with it. Don't move it around. You'll end up losing it. Find something and keep it. Understand that the rate of return of the stock market over the years is this and this and this. I want you to envision instead of that course of thought, the kingdom of God. Let's say there was a corporation called Jesus Christ Incorporated. Let's say you invested one dollar the day that company went public back in zero AD. You invested one dollar in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And let's say over time it yielded a, a modest return of say six percent interest compounded annually. Two thousand years later you'd have seven hundred and twenty quadrillion dollars from that one investment. The financial planners of this world say think long term, 30 years, 50 years. What's going to happen in 3,000 years? Kingdom investment continues to reap reward. It's something that will pay and pay and pay. It never runs out. It's an eternal supply. We have to start acting and living like people who are dreaming for a future that's out there. And it could be a thousand years from now. Are people still, because of your investment in the kingdom, going to be coming to Christ? Because you invested in the life. I recently read there was a, a farmer, actually a farm hand on a farm, that led Billy Graham's father to Christ. That wouldn't, it just wouldn't let up. That just continued pestering him, bothering him with the claims of Christ until finally he relented and said, okay. And he gave his heart to Jesus Christ. He passed on his faith to his son, Billy Graham. How many people today in the world have had their lives completely changed for Jesus Christ because of the ministry of that one man? How many millions of people have been influenced because of that farmhand who took the time and wouldn't let up in sharing Jesus Christ with one guy's dad? Just imagine the returns 
I mean, we look at things too myopic, too small. We look at life in little tiny pieces and we forget that the investments we make in eternity are investments that are going to bear interest for thousands of years if Jesus doesn't come back before that. We must be about his kingdom. Kingdom investment continues to reap rewards. And we must have the right sovereign. You know, third, is it going to be money? Is it going to be God? He says, no one can serve two masters. Either we're going to hate the one and love the other, or we'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. Jesus expressly says here the impossibility of dual lordship. You might have dual citizenship, but you can never have dual lordship. Somebody trumps everything else. Someone's telling you what to do. There's only room in your heart for one Lord. Is it going to be God or is it going to be money? The writing of money with a capital letter is informative. They, they write that in most of the translations. It's a capital N. You can't serve both God and money or God and mammon. They'll capitalize it. They personify it. It's listing it not as a thing but as a person. It's an idol. It's a false deity is what they're saying. It's got power. It's got pull in your life. Money has weight. Money has mass. Therefore, it exerts a gravitational pull like all objects that have mass. Everything has a gravitational pull to it if it has mass. Understand, money has a gravitational pull. It will draw you in. When you start to amass money, its gravitational pull is stronger. The more you try to save, the more it will own you. The more you'll worry about it, the more you'll fear for it, the more you'll think about it. It will occupy more and more of your heart and your mind. That's why he's telling us very clearly that we need to give it to him. When you start to amass it, it just grows stronger. Small M money might be neutral, but capital M money is not. It's an unruly power. It will own you. If you start to stack that stuff up, it's no longer lowercase. It becomes capital. It's no longer just money. It's mammon. It's a false god. And it starts to exert that gravitational pull on your life. Now, how do you keep yourself from getting wrapped up in this orbit of mammon here or money? Well, first thing is don't amass it. Don't stockpile it on earth. It'll pull you into that gravitational field. Send it to heaven. Invest it in kingdom ministry and your heart's going to start getting pulled there. There's only one place where your heart can go at a time. You understand why the Bible commends simplicity and frugality saving for Christ's followers. Why does it do that? It's because money amassed is a gravitational force. Proverbs 30, verse 8 says this. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of God. See what he's saying? There's a force to money. There's power there. And Paul said to his protege Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, we brought nothing into this world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. Because we brought nothing in, we can't take anything. The Bible commends us for simple shelter, food, clothing, for the basics of life. That's all the treasure we need on this side. Send the rest of it on so there's no gravitational pull of the world and its transient nature. Understand, money wants to own you. It doesn't want to just put you in debt, though it does. I mean, so many of us, and some here can testify, that, you know, because of easy credit and those mixed with the desires of our heart to have more will create a, an environment where you'll find yourself way over your head in debt in no time. It just happens. You know, I didn't realize. I mean, it's like that soldier I had in my unit in, in back at Fort Bragg where he came into my office and said, but, but, but sir... He said, these guys, he handed me all these NSF checks, you know, these non-sufficient funds checks and all. And he said, these, the bank is telling me I don't have any money left, and I still got 16 checks in my checkbook. It just didn't get it. He just didn't understand. He, th he thinks, hey, you know, as, as long as there's free money, it's like a credit card, free money, as long as that free money is out there, 
then I should be able to buy it. We don't have to think and save and plan for any kind of investment anymore. We can just pull out a credit card and slap it on the table. But understand what that does. It creates this thing in our mind that has a gravitational pull. Materialism will yank at you. It will physically pull you. You can almost feel it. You can sense the anxiety in your heart when you go into a store and you look at something you know you can't afford and you just begin to drool like Pavlov's dogs. All of a sudden, it's like somebody rang the bell. You know, and here we go. Because, because that thing is pulling at you. And that's the way materialism is. That's why God is telling us. We've got to get these priorities right in our lives. Send the rest of it on ahead. Let's take care of what we need, sure. We need to provide for our families. I'm not suggesting we don't. There's nothing wrong with having much. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just what owns you. And understand, we can get so... Uh, you know, I, I look at a, a guy that's very close to me, and I know real well that he's got more than enough for anything he would ever need. And every single day, he goes into all of his accounts and he writes down on the date thing on his calendar exactly how much money he had that day. You know, it, it's, it's kind of, I, I tried to tell him, it, you know, it's kind of like watching, you know, water boil. You know, they say that it, it, it doesn't boil, a watched pot boils slower or something like that. There, it's not going to get bigger because you're looking at it. All that will happen is it will own you. Pretty soon you're so worried about it, and that's all you can think about. And you can't wait till the next day when you can look at it again. Everything is like that in our lives if we let it. We've got to let go and understand that God has to be the priority in our lives. Don't let that happen that you're owned by material things. God gives us all things to enjoy, but we're only here for a short time. Send on ahead what we can, because that's where we'll be spending eternity. The right storehouse the right stance, and making sure God is the right and only sovereign in your life. That's what puts us right when it comes to money. We need to understand just what's in our wallets. More importantly, just whose it is. And let's keep those things straight in our lives. We've learned those lessons hard over our lives. We've got a bunch of testimonies in our life of what God has done in Avery and me. You know, I've, I've probably shared one with some of you about when we first tithed. We learned, did I, how many of you I told that story to? There were, oh, not very many. We first learned about tithing. And tithing is really a principle that has to do with ownership. It, well, all it, it is is really, it's just saying, who's, who's in charge here? Who's, who's the boss? That's what tithing determines. And uh, we were uh, young Christians. We'd only been Christians for about a year one year exactly. We've been Christians for a year. So this was back in like 1926, 77. No, a long time. No, this was a long time ago. And uh, we'd been Christians for about a year. We were in college. Uh, we didn't have very much. Were we in college or in the military? We were already at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. So I was in the officer basic course there. We didn't, I was a second lieutenant. We didn't have very much money. And we had gotten a little ahead of ourselves. Any young couple, any as young couple, you ever get a little ahead of yourself? Anybody else? Nobody but me. I got a little bit ahead of myself. We were having trouble. We were just, it seemed like there was, there was always, there were always more bills than there was money in the bank. And we were talking, actually Avery was talking, I think. I wasn't in the conversation. With this friend of ours who happened to be a Christian. It was the first Christian I think we met in the, in, after we got out of college. And uh, uh, was it the Dills? Yeah. And, uh, and so... Avery was telling her this story about how we were struggling financially, and she asked her the question. She says, well, do you tithe? And Avery's like, do we what? You know, do you tithe? Do you, do you take the first 10% of what you get and give it to God? Tithe? No, we don't tithe. And what is that? And she told us, or she told Avery what that was. So Avery came back to me, and she said, Larry, um, who was it? Was that... Oh, that was Leah, okay, who told us. And, and so Leah, they were like from North Dakota or someplace, right? They were from somewhere. But anyway, they came in, and, and uh, Avery came back, and she told me. She said, Larry, we need to start tithing. Oh, what's that? She said, well, we need to give the first 10% of what we make to God. Oh, really? Um, how about we start with a little less than that? And, uh, and so I think at first we, like, tithe on the net, you know, of what we got or something. We did something. 
And we wrote this check out on Sunday, and we put it in there with, with much uh, consternation in the offering. We put this biggest check we've ever given to any church ever. It was probably like 30 bucks or something. I don't know what it was. It wasn't much back then. But anyway, we put that money in there. Faith, we put it in there believing God. Well, that next, that week, was it like on a Tuesday or something? On the weekend? Okay, well, on the, the next weekend, we go to the officer's club and play bingo. <laughs> this will tell you where I was in my faith, okay? Anyway, I, we go to the officer's club. We, we, we won $70 in bingo. And we said, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. And you know, we didn't tithe on that 70 bucks either. <laughs> But it kind of started us down a road. And I mean, it wasn't about the 70 bucks. I mean, that was just kind of, that was an aside, okay? And, and please, don't go up to Soaring Eagle because of what I <laughs> just said. But there was a principle here. When we began, and, and ever since, we've not struggled with it. We've not, every, you know, to give 10% of, of our paycheck to God, we don't even think of it. We think of God has given us 90%. That's how we look at it. We don't even look at it as all, all this money that goes on. No, it, we just honor God with And you know, God has done so many amazing things in our lives. And every time we've done above and beyond, I can tell you stories of a pastor that told us one week you should try giving 90% to God and keeping the 10. And we did. And God blessed us with a car and all kinds of... We've had all kinds of things like that happen in our lives where we just responded to God and God met us where we were and we've never wanted. He's always blessed us. Have we done stupid things like going out and buying new stereos? Or all? Yes, we've done lots of stupid things. Have we repented and cried out to God for it? Yes, many times our carpet's worn out. But the fact is that God has always been there to help us through the difficult times and to bless us. And we've never had lack in our lives. Not really, because God has always been there. When you put him at that place of honor in your life, you center your life around God, bless you in every way. And it's all about giving it to him. You know, you don't give it to the church. You don't give it to the board here or to pastor. You give it to God. This is just a place where you bring it into the storehouse. That's all. But it isn't like we need the money. I don't need the money. I really don't. The church doesn't need your money. You need to give. There's a huge difference. God takes care of his church. God takes care of his pastors. God takes care of him. It's not you. I don't work for Trinity. I work for the Lord. He's the one that I'm following. You know, and if we will get everything straight here, and put the money where it's supposed to be and honor God with what he asks us to do, you will be blessed in your life. But we've got to learn to trust him. It's all about trust. What's in your wallet? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that you would hear our hearts today. What, what we want more than anything in our lives is to honor you because you're the one who is the source of all life. Uh, not just resources, but life itself. And oh God, if we can just get that in us today and help us. There might be some that are struggling here with the whole idea of lordship. Maybe they've been afraid to give their lives completely to you for fear of what might happen next. And yet, Lord, you're the one who drew up the, the blueprints of their life before they were ever born. You know them. You know what's best for them, better than they ever could, better than I ever could. And so, Lord, I pray that today would be a day of surrender. It would be a day, Lord God, where we would look to you and we would say, God, it's your way and not mine. Did I make the world? Did I form the oceans? Did I carve the canyons? Did, did I create all these people? No, you did. You did. So, God, help us to center our lives back where they need to be in you to do what we need to do, to respond to your spirit, to be men and women of integrity. And Lord, I pray for those that might not know you in this place, that for the first time, maybe they would experience the love of God. You're, you're, you love us. You care for every detail of our lives. When we try to do it our way, we fail. But God, when we give it to you and follow you, you always meet us there. You always help us and give us strength. And listen, before we, we are about to take communion, before we go there, Keep your heads bowed for just a moment. 
There might be someone here that your heart is just not where it needs to be with God, and you know it. You know you've been living your life the wrong way for a long time, and it hasn't worked out very well for you. In fact, you realize today that you need him more than ever in every area of your life, not just in your finances, but in your relationships, in your love for him, in your love for yourself. You, you need God today in your life. Well, the good news is that he's here for you. If you'll surrender your heart to him, he'll come in. He'll give you a brand new start. He'll pay the price for your sin. He'll pay it with his own blood just because he loves you. He'll save you to the uttermost, he says. So will you turn to him today with your heads bowed and eyes closed? If that's you, when you'd say, I need the Lord in my life and I know it. Maybe I've been trying to fool everybody, living a life that looks like I'm a believer when I'm not, or maybe, or maybe I've never known, no one ever told me that I could experience the love of God in Jesus Christ. But right now, Pastor, I need him in my life and I know it. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, I want you to do this one simple thing. I'm not gonna embarrass anybody, but you wanna be included in this prayer. Then I just want you to lift your hand up real high right now and just lift it up to the Lord. Sure, hands are going up, you bet. Hold them up high. Do you mean it? Hold it up there. If you really mean it, stand up. Just stand right up to your feet right now. Don't be ashamed, just stand up if that's you. And I want everyone to pray this prayer. For those that are standing as well as everyone here in the pew, pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you with all my heart. And I know you love me. And so today I surrender to you. My heart, my life, all that I am. And I ask you to come in and cleanse me of all sin. I thank you, Lord. And I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you were born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for me, and rose on the third day from the grave. Today, you're praying for me. And today, Lord, I reach out to you. And I thank you that from this day forward, you are my Lord, and you only. I'm yours, Lord, and you're mine. In Jesus' name, amen.